Although you can bake in applications during the image capture process, arguably a better way to manage applications is to layer them in. What I mean by that is on the client computer, you would put down the operating system, then put down the drivers, then put down the applications, and the applications are separate from the actual operating system. This makes lifecycle management much easier and is a more mature way to do imaging. But there is a caveat with this because it does take a little bit of work to set up all those applications beforehand. And in this video series, I'm going to show you how that's done. I'm going to start by going through your application repository and showing you how to set that up and how to organize it. I'll also go through simple application installs like executables or MSIs. I'll go through immutable software such as uh, NuGet packages or how to use Chocolaty. I'll go through scripts like VB scripts and PowerShell scripts and how to call scripts through Smart Imager as well as how to call direct commands to Windows directly from the Smart Imager console. Then I'll go through troubleshooting applications and adding those into an application pack to be, to be delivered to the client. Now this video series is quite long, but if you watch it end to end, you'll definitely learn something. And I do recommend that you watch it end to end at least once. If you want, I've separated this out into several videos so you can jump to the section you want. At any rate, let's go ahead and get to the console and get started. Before we add any applications, we want to make sure that our application repositories are well organized, neat and clean. It's not just a good idea, it's actually somewhat mandatory. And what I mean by that is, when you set up your application repository, you want to take your applications and put each application in its own uniquely named folder. Now, by default, Smart Imager comes with its own repository, and that's under the Program Files Circs Smart Imagers Repositories directory, and you'll find one there called Applications, and that's the one we're going to deal with today. In Applications, and you can see I'm here in my server, I have a, a folder, and for each folder, I have an application in that folder. If I look at 7-zip, for instance, in here I'll have only 7-zip binaries. If I go up and I look at Adobe Reader, I see I have a subfolder named Reader, and then I have only binaries that are relating to Adobe. A real popular one would be Office. So if we take a look at Office, we can see that we have the setup EXE for Office 365, and then we have some subfolders underneath those. Now, you don't have to use the application repository that came with Smart Imager but it would be faster for you if you do. And the reason is, is because everything needs to be copied to the server anyway uh, when the application pack is compiled, compressed, and um, all the applications are put in its own unique zip file. Uh, secondarily, um, when you choose an application and when you're pointing to a folder, Smart Imager is going to default to looking at the Smart Imager repository applications directory anyway, so you'd have to do some extra browsing from there. We'll get into that a little bit later in a little bit more detail, but for now, go ahead and use the application repository that came with Smart Imager. And now let's go ahead and go to the console. And in the console, what we're going to do is we're going to choose components and applications. And here's where we're going to make all of our applications. As you saw earlier from the server, I have a 7-zip directory, and in there I have a 32-bit version and a 64-bit version of 7-zip. And here, if we look at the console, we can see that I've already created a 7-zip um, application already. And what I'm doing is I'm referencing that 7-zip folder here under Program File Circ Smart Imager repositories, applications, I'm referencing that folder, and then I'm just, in the install command, I'm saying which binary I want to call. So let's go ahead and start with one from scratch. I'm going to add, how about Adobe Reader? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Create, and then I'm going to give it any name I want to name it. Now the name is not important, it's really just a reference for you. I'm going to name this Adobe Reader DC. 
and I'll click Create. So the first thing I need to do is I need to tell it where the folder is if I'm choosing a binary to install. So I'll click the Browse button next to that, and you'll see that it automatically brings me to my applications directory under my Smart Imager repository. That's why I'm saying it's easier if you use the repository that comes with Smart Imager, because it'll assume you want to use that repository. So from here, I'm looking for an Adobe Reader DC directory, and sure enough, I find it because I've placed it there, and I don't want the binary from there. I actually want it out of the Reader directory, so I'm going to go into the subdirectory off of Adobe Reader named Reader, and I'll go ahead and click OK. Now, the next thing I need to do is I need to choose an install command, and really, for this one, it's just a matter of pointing at the MSI file. In this case, it's going to look at that reader directory, and it's going to give me all the binaries in that reader directory. I just need to select the one I want to install. In this case, it's called acroread.msi, and I'm going to click OK. From here, I'm just going to click Save. So I've set up my first application, and that is Adobe Reader DC. Now, it's important to note where these applications will end up once they're on the client side once you've installed them during imaging. So you'll notice that from here I'm referencing the applications repository, and I'm referencing specifically the Adobe Reader and then Reader directory. When an application is copied over to the client and installed on the client during imaging, it's going to use the last folder that's referenced in the folder path. So in this case, it's just going to be Reader. As you can see, I have now five different applications. 7-Zip, I have Adobe Reader. Uh, I actually have that twice because I, I put it in there twice. Foxit and an imaging branding here. Now, if I look at a client that I've already installed Smart Imager on and I've already imaged with, we can see that on that client, we have under the apps directory, under C apps, we have a 7-Zip folder and we have a Foxit folder, and we have an image information folder, and then we have a Reader folder. And the reason we don't have the Adobe Reader DC folder, and we just have the Reader folder, and in there you'll see the binaries for Adobe Reader, is because we told it to reference that Reader folder child. And once again, if we look at that, we can see that Smart Imager is always going to reference the last folder that we chose from the folder path. All right, I hope that makes a bit of sense to you. I'm going to go ahead and close this out, and because I've already got an Adobe Reader in here, I'm going to go ahead and delete this. Now, for 7-Zip, you'll notice that on the repository, I had both a 64-bit and a 32-bit. So what I'm going to do for the 64-bit is I'm going to put a compatibility of a 64-bit operating system, and I'll click Save. And you'll notice that in this case, it's looking for a just an executable. And I know that to install that silently, I just use a forward slash s. If you don't know, you can easily just uh, research how to install a, a, an application silently. So just use your favorite search engine and just type the name of the application, in this case, 7-Zip, and then type in Silent Install, and you'll find, you know, a half a dozen pages at least that'll tell you how to install that silently. In other words, what silent switches to use. So in order to install 7-Zip silently, and I want to make sure that I don't have any user interaction here, I use the forward slash s. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a new 7-Zip and this new one is going to be for a 32-bit operating system. So I'll click Create, and I'll type in 7-Zip, and I'll just make this for 32-bit. And here, for the folder path, I want to choose my 7-Zip directory. And you'll notice that I'm referencing it twice now, once with the 64-bit and once with the 32-bit. It's okay if I reference the same repository, to the same directory twice, but what I cannot do is I cannot reference two different repositories with the same name, and that is because Windows won't let two different um, folders be the same name under the same directory. So in the install command, what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for that 32-bit, and I'm going to click OK, 
And then I know to silently install that, I need a forward slash capital S and I'll click save. From here, I'm going to make this so it's only valid for 32-bit operating systems and click save. And so now I'm done. Now you'll notice that I have a 64-bit version of 7-zip referencing the 7-zip folder and I have a 32-bit version of 7-zip uh, also referencing the same folder. On the client side, when I look at this, the problem is, is that I will have two different files under that 7-zip folder, even though only one of them got installed. So I really may not want this. I really might want to separate that into two totally separate folders, a 7-zip 64-bit and a 7-zip 32-bit to make that a little bit easier. And I think that that's what I'm going to do um, in, uh, with, when I install Google Chrome. So I'll go ahead and click close here because I've saved that. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a new executable. And this is gonna be for an application called KeePass. So I think it's K-E-E -E Pass. Oops, I named that wrong and it's not a big deal if I do that because I can always edit the name in here. The folder path, I'm gonna choose and go to my key pass directory and click OK. And this one also installs an executable and I'm gonna choose that executable. But I know from experience that I don't use a forward slash S to install this executable. I actually have to do a very silent and a no restart. So what I'm gonna do is I just copied that out of Notepad and I'm gonna type it in here, paste it in rather. So here to install this silently, I can say very silent, no restart. Again, every executable is gonna be different on how they install silently. I'll go ahead and click save on that. Now let's get to installing Google Chrome. And the first way I wanna do this, I wanna say Chrome 32-bit. And again, named it wrong, not a big deal. Come in here and change it. And from here, what I've done is I've created a Chrome 32-bit direct directory, even though I named it x32, it should be x86. Um, and so I'm gonna reference that, that directory, and on the install command, I'm, I'm just gonna choose, it's an MSI, so I'm just gonna choose the MSI. Smart Imager knows how to install MSIs uh, silently, so it'll automatically put in that silent switch. Again, however, I can do a no restart or I can do an all users if I wanted to install it for all users, for instance. If you want to look up all the different switches for an MSI, just type in MSI exec, that's MSI EXEC, uh, in a command prompt with a forward slash question mark and it'll give you all of the references on how to use, because MSI is a, is a, um, standard that was created for Microsoft, so every MSI is gonna have the same basic switches you can use. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and click Save, and I can just clone this, and so that's what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna clone it, and I take the copy, and I'm gonna name it 64-bit, and instead of referencing the 32-bit directory, which is named wrong, again, x32 should be x86, but uh, I'll reference the 64-bit, and then I need to reference a different binary, and that's the 64-bit binary here. And again, it'll come in with a forward slash QN, and I'll click Save. This is going to be a little bit better because this way, if I'm installing it on a 32-bit operating system, which I'll force now with compatibility and say this is only good for 32-bit operating systems, and I'll come in here and on the 64-bit, I'll say this is only good for 64-bit operating systems. So now the 32-bit directory won't be copied over to the 64-bit OS and vice versa. So I can actually limit the amount of um, binaries and, and fluff that's in my um, apps directory on my client PC. Couple other things I wanna to touch on real quickly is that there's different install types here. So you'll notice that I haven't touched this so far. I left it as the default, which is during imaging. Another one we can use is install after imaging or after the domain join. So what I would do and when I would use this or is when I'm installing things like an antivirus agent or perhaps a systems management agent. I have an antivirus agent that I want to install 
and that's called Silence. So I'll go ahead and choose Silence. I'll search for the directory here and choose my Silence directory. And the binary I want to install on this one is going to be this MSI, and I'll click OK, and then I'll click Save. But I want to make sure that this isn't installed until after the imaging process is completely done and um, it's joined the domain. So what I want to do is I want to select this bottom one here. And so what this will do is this will say it'll image the computer, put the drivers down, put all the applications down, do all your configuration settings and anything else you want it to do. It'll join the domain and then right before Smart Imager self-destructs, it'll install this Silence agent. And the reason I want to is because most antivirus agents and most systems management agents will have a parent that they need to talk to on the network. And A, I'll need those domain credentials to talk to that parent. And B, once I do talk to that parent, I may have a lot of traffic going back and forth. So I don't want to interrupt the imaging process um, during imaging. I want to wait until after it's on the domain and after everything else in imaging is done before I install this. So in this case, I'll choose after domain join and click save. A couple other things and a couple other options I have in here is you'll notice that I have a retry. A retry says, look, if I come into an error when I'm trying to install this, what I want you to do is I want you to reboot the computer and retry it again. It'll do this three times. After the third time, it'll go to this required and if it's tried to install this particular application three times and it can't, it's rebooted each time and every time it comes back in with an error, should it continue imaging or should it stop imaging and wait for manual intervention? So that's what my required is for and I can turn this on or off. If I turn this off here, then it'll basically say, okay, it'll, it'll fail the imaging process and it'll halt right there. And if I turn it on, then it will continue on and it'll just ignore that. But it will be in um, the log file and let you know that it did fail. If it should reboot after I install this, so there's some applications that you'll want to install and you, then you'll want to force a reboot. I could tell it to always to force that reboot. I can say only, only reboot if you have an error. Or I can say even if you have an error, I don't want you to reboot. I, in fact, I want you to suppress all reboots. Um, by default, it's going to be only on error, so the only time it will reboot between installing applications is if, if an application fails. And lastly, I have exit codes. And exit codes I can put in if I know for sure that the return code from an application is not going to be a successful return code, um, but something that Windows refers to as an error, for instance, like a 1619. I can say, okay, if you get a return code of 1619, I want you to treat that as a successful install and just go on to the next application. I can put as many error codes as I want in there. So if I put in like 1619, I can put another one. I just need to put it on a new line. So on the new line, I could put 21, you know, whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and erase all those because I don't need any exit codes for this particular application and um, I'm going to click Save. The one last thing we didn't go into is that is cleanup, and that's leave files after installation. And what it means by that is on our client machine, when we see this 7-zip directory, for instance, right? If I didn't want this 7-zip directory to be there after I installed 7-zip, what I would do is I would come over here to 7-zip, and I would say, I don't want you to leave the files. I want you to delete all the files after the installation. And what it's going to do is it's going to delete this reference folder. So on the client app, on the client side, you're not going to see this 7-zip folder. This 7-zip folder would actually be deleted after the imaging process.